for tonight. We now move into old business. Old business number one, this is a possible motion to introduce a bond order authorizing the issuance of up to $48 million in parks and recreation facilities bonds subject to approval by the voters. Sean Purvis, the assistant town manager, is presenting. Mr. Uh, Mayor, all of the members of town council, uh, what you have before you on the motion, this is step two of three um, regarding uh, movement toward the referendum in November. The second step is to introduce the bond order and authorize the finance officer to file sworn statement of debt and statement of the estimated interest. Uh, the, we have already filed the application to the LGC per your um, request at, the la at your last meeting. Uh, the third and final step will come in August, That's the public hearing. Uh, your decision tonight uh, moving forward with the, um, the order also would call for the public hearing to be established on August 1st. I stand by to answer any questions you may have. All right. Um, before we open the floor for questions for Sean, just as a reminder, this is a normal step, step two of three in the process. I don't expect us to have any questions because we, this is all contingent on the referendum November 7th. Uh, but I'll ask, are there any questions or is there a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to, to authorize the issuance um, and allow the staff to continue with this session or this step in the process. Any further discussion on that motion? All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. Okay. It passes 3-1. <clears throat> we now move to unfinished business. Unfinished business 01 and 02, we're going to uh, discuss these together. Just as a reminder, um, this is a continued item that was a public hearing June the 20th, and uh, Mike Clark is doing the presentation. Council, we will be considering the annexation and the rezoning uh, vote tonight. Mr. Clark. Um, I'm going to go through this uh, very quickly, namely just highlighting the things that have been changed since the June 20th meeting. In terms of the annex, well, once again, this is a three-part uh, application. There's the annexation for a select number of properties, and then there's both a 2030 future land use or 2030 land use map amendment, as well as a rezoning. Uh, once again, to orient you to the site, um, you have Hume Olive located here, uh, Richardson Road located right there. This is the track that is subject to the annexation. And then in terms of the 2030 future or the 2030 land use amendment and um, rezoning request, the applicant is still requesting it to be rezoned to plain unit development. Since the June 20th meeting, the applicant has uh, made a, um, not significant modifications, but still modifications, uh, namely, um, within section five of the PD document, uh, table one would include three additional uses, medical or dentist or dental clinic or office, medical or dental laboratory and research facility. And once again, um, those would be going in this location right here as available uses. <coughs> the back to that for a second. Is, is, is that the area, that's the area that has the... Uh, or sorry, in, within this Within this that one. Okay, yep. and that is section? That is within section one. Section one. Labeled mixed uses. They've added those two numbers, okay. Yep. Well, those three uses. Three. Yep. Uh, the second modification was to um, section six of the development, uh, namely changing the minimum lot size from 5,000 square feet to 6,000 square feet, with an average lot size from 7,500 to 10,000 square feet. That would be in this location here. You said 7,500 average to 10,000? That's yeah. correct. 10, and that includes wetlands and everything else? Oh, okay, that's the minimum lot size. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. Um, which, in effect, would also reduce the number of residential units from 100 to 75 that would fit within that area. Um, finally, the applicant has made a clarifying statement um, that section one, which is the section that has the additional uses, 
um, will have up to 5,000 or 50,000 square feet of commercial and may have up to 20 or uh, 220,000 square feet of office space and may have uh, 320 uh, residential um, units or a combination thereof. The final numbers haven't been determined, but those are up to 220,000 square feet of office. That is correct. What's the minimum? Um, and what section is this again? This is section one. If there was a minimum that has not changed, however, let me take a look. See, I don't know why we have maximums, but I can see how we, why we would have minimums. It does not appear that the applicant put a minimum within the plan unit development document. So we get zero. Is that correct? I'm sorry? We could have zero. That could be correct. Um, finally, the applicant, uh, well, additionally, the applicant has indicated that a minimum of two townhome pads would be located uh, within section two, and uh, um, that could accommodate up or um, at least eight townhomes. And section two is located in this location here. Uh, finally, some information came last week regarding the conservation easement and the Army Corps of Engineers has indicated that is not a preferable location. So the applicant is also proposing a condition that they'll work with town staff, um, Wake County Public School System and other entities in order to determine an appropriate location for the continuation of Richardson Road, um, being that this location is unlikely. And Shannon Cox is here if there's any more questions regarding that component because she's far more versed in that than I am. I thought that was resolved, but it's not resolved. That is correct. It is not resolved. The uh, One of the alternatives would have it, um, the uh, no impact would have it swinging down. would have it swinging down this way and around and back over. Right along the school property? Uh, the final location hasn't been determined. And well, if it went that way, that would be right along the school property. It would, well, it could potentially clip on the school property. Is, um, <clears throat> is the transportation plan still call for a crossing at some point across here? In other words, it's not going to just disappear? Okay. Okay. But but we want one from a planning perspective. We want one somewhere along that creek, right? <laughs> yeah, okay. All right. That was all the modifications that the applicant has made since the last meeting, um, and with the exception of having the approval being contingent upon um, the uh, applicant working with the town in regard, or the town as well as Wake County Public Schools in terms of the relocation of Richardson Road, um, the staff position does not change. Any other questions for Mike? Section one is uh, the one where we're talking about the 220,000 square feet of office. Actually, actually, that's correct. Is that correct? Now, I understand that's moved up to phase two. That is, uh, the applicant has indicated that. But there's no minimum. There's no minimum. So what can we have? All houses? Is that right? Potentially. That doesn't lock anything in. I mean, there is part of the I call it out. Well, there is one component um, for apartments. Minimum 50% of the apartments would be on the second floor.
fifty percent of the apartments would be on the second floor, meaning the first floor would be retail. Or office or some other use. I couldn't imagine office on a first floor. I mean. Isn't that the section that we're rezoning to non residential? And that there's a part of this that we're rezoning to non residential. Where's that at? Oh, to mix, amending uh, the future land use map? Right. Yeah, this is a portion of that would be. Uh, currently, this is the future land use map. It shows this area as uh, mixed, medium density, and uh, commercial services. The applicant is proposing to have office, uh, office employment, high density to residential, as well as commercial services in that location as well as extending along the boundary of the school. So we would be protected in section one at the at least 30 percent minimum, correct? Correct. Well, it's not in section one, it's in the entirety of the outlined area. I don't know, I don't know where that map is. I keep looking for it. I can't see that. Yeah, I'm looking for it also. What page is the map on? Are they? Oh, here we're going into it, I guess. Talking about page 119. And unfinished number two, unfinished business 02. So, yeah, that kind of shows it. But they're, they're wanting to rezone outside of the section one, right, into the other area, is that what that's showing? Modify right. the future, or the 2030 future land use map, that's correct, which would be over in this area as well, which I believe is... But in there, section one, we'd be protected at the 30%, correct? Within the boundaries of this blue line right here, which includes section three as well, I believe. That's the number. And section three is yes. the section that has the large lot subdivision where the people haven't really sold into this deal. Portion of that is correct. But they're agreeing to rezone it, right? They're willing to rezone it, but which essentially says that they're locked in at some point we're at gonna, some point yeah. if they ever die. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean it doesn't it Let's doesn't mean sell. much of anything. <laughs> no, hopefully they sell before they die. I don't know. I I, I just think that the way it's well, we're not. The way it's set up is we're not. Um, nothing's locked in for non-residential. Very little. Can Mike? Can you make clear for for the area that's along both Hume Olive Road and the Richardson Extension? Those parcels. What's the what's the smallest amount of non-residential use that the that this plan guarantees? Just to be clear for everyone. That I don't know if I have that calculation handy. I apologize. Um, within the Within the boundaries of this blue line, at least 30% would have to be non-residential. Okay. Our boundaries of that blue line. Within this blue line here. Okay. And 30. so that's south of Hume Olive. 30%. And, oh, I'm sorry. And along the Richardson extension, with the, the Richardson extension bisecting it. Correct. This okay. uh, gray dotted line is the current configuration uh -huh. of the Richardson Road extension. So there is 30% of that that's, minimum. That's by acreage. Yep, by acreage. Right. But, but it's not 30% of the whole development. No. By any means. Uh -huh. So the areas in Section 1 and Section 3 are the ones that are shown as the mixed-use area subject to the 30%, and it's the acreage mm -hmm. of those two. And so Section 3 on here says 21 acres. Section 1, I can't read the acreage. It has the word mixed-use over it. So we're going to be in the neighborhood of 13 to 15 acres ish of non-residential minimum. Minimum. Um, well, it's 
Yeah, I don't know what the uh, section one is to do that uh, now. 35.6 acres. And yeah, yeah, it's just those two. 30% of that is like 12. So that's about 15, 16 acres minimum. Well, right? it's over 50,000, so yeah, it's going to be over 15 acres. Yeah. And it does say on this map that the, um, the, I mean, the commercial section is all commercial. They can't put anything else there. So section three, whatever square footage they put there is guaranteed. You know, they're going to develop it mm -hmm. as much as they can, and they're allowed up to 170,000 square foot. In section three. In section three, that's guaranteed. And then the limitation in section one is on the on the apartments. 50% mm -hmm. of the apartments cannot be on the ground floor, so depending on how many apartments they build, in terms of building-wise, you're going to have either retail or office on the first floor. Is there a height restriction out there? Yes. Um, within Section 1, maximum building height um, is 54 uh, feet, and in Section 3, it's 42 feet. So is it 10 feet per story, roughly? Well, it's, they list as maximum stories of 4 feet within Section 1 and 3 stories within Section 3. I personally like this project still. I think it got even better with the increased lot size in the back. That's something I've really worked with them about. Um, the non-residential portion of the residential development is something that they are the only ones that have brought to the table of all the residential developments. You know, um, that's going to be a major intersection there, Hemi Olive and Richardson Road. Um, I think we'll see that come online. Well, I'll tell you, I, I like I like the the concept, except I don't like the timing. The timing just is not there in section three. It doesn't exist. They can't exist because they don't own the property. We can lock that property into non-residential whenever it goes, but that could be 20 years from now. Yeah, but well you and I know from economic development, all the stuff we see is what what property do you have rezoned? If it's not even rezoned, then they're packing and moving on. That handles one of the most difficult steps for these people, for non-residential developers. And I agree that if you don't have it rezoned, I totally agree with you. You're absolutely correct. But if you have it, but it takes two to tango, and if it's rezoned for something and a developer comes by and says, I really like that, and the homeowner <coughs> says, well, I really like living here, you've got nothing. And that's my concern. It, it, it's it, because, the parcels, because the parcel is not owned well, by the development. For real. Yeah. I agree, but to me, I mean, I'm no developer, but I kind of see a high demand for that uh, parcel three. So once they start building, building I've out. heard that. I've heard that. I haven't seen it happen yet. But uh, it's the same as with Sears. And another one. I think where it is out there with those schools, you're going, you're going to have to have some retail and office. And obviously, I, if I owned land out there, I would be more than happy to sell it to Bojangles, for them to put something in out there because you know that's what they're going to need. And <laughs> but you're a civic-minded person. Well, those I, people might want to just stay there. We heard from a bunch of them tonight. I also like to, <laughs> that one I like to not be a wise investment person, too, and I, I have land. I, I've always said that when they built Friendship High School out there, if I was a man, you better believe I'd be called um, Bojangles tomorrow. And, uh, that's high, you that's high cholesterol. You know that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I, I don't mean it, but I you know, <laughs> char grill, what is it, cookout, I hear it all yeah. the time. You know, that's, that's why I think it's, I kind of relate to this area over here today on um, Laura Duncan. I'm surprised that that is not filled out more because of the high school. Um, I, I do like this plan because it is mixed use and you have a lot of different types of homes out there. You know, I do a little homework, and I know you're surprised, but I do a little homework about how many people come into Apex every day to work. 
-hmm. because we always talk about people leaving. There's actually about 14,000 people that actually come into Apex okay. to work. And I know we have a large percentage that go out, but those 14,000 people, is it because they can't afford to live here? Is it they don't want to live here? Um, or what is it? But um, I, I, when I talk to school, I know a lot of teachers that could not afford to live in Apex. And what this project to me is doing is getting um, those teachers out there place to live. I, I did a little more math. I know I told you I was a math person, but I used a calculator. I did some and figured it out. I looked up how many teachers or staff members are at all these schools in Apex. And my number came up to be about 11,000 people are employed in the schools that are Apex proper. I'm not talking about Middle Creek or West Lake. I'm talking about the ones in Apex. And that doesn't include Friendship Middle and Friendship Elementary. They're going to be okay. wow. Wow. So uh, that's a lot of people that, uh, 11, that's 11,000, 1,100 people. 1,100. Uh, 1,100. Okay. 1,100. I was about to say, how many yeah. students do we have? There's a lot of students. I mean, I saw that number too. But it's 14,000 people travel into APEC. I told you it was math. 1,100 people um, work at these schools. And that, like I said before, that doesn't include your um, new schools out there, friendship, or your private schools or charter schools that are in APEC season. Um, and I think we all know that starting teachers make less than $40,000 and they need somewhere to live. Um, not just your, your teachers, it's your retail people um, that need somewhere to live too. And yeah, you know, sometimes they have to have a roommate. My daughter has to have a roommate and uh, people have to have roommates to be able to, to get by, but at least there's a place that they can live and work and then hopefully with this out there because of the people that are going to be there at the schools that will cause more economic development in that area for your um, shops, restaurants, um, cleaners, whatever people use, your services. I mean all those people out there now have to drive a couple miles for all that, you know. This will bring an opportunity. You know, fortunately I am no longer teaching and even more fortunately I no longer have kids that are in high school driving. But I tell you, if my kids were out there at Friendship High School, I'd be very concerned about them driving in to to um, try to get back to school by lunchtime. And Richardson Road, I'll say it again, uh, when I see a connection there, you all know we need that and we need it great that they're putting in the infrastructure on me. Um, Habitat for Humanity, I mean, let's not forget that. Again, you're making um, affordable housing for people. And, you know, people go, well, what kind of people live in uh, Habitat for Humanity? And the ones that were built over at White Oak, um, some teacher assistants live in those. So, they're, you know, they're good people. They are paying for their homes. And it also brings some diversity into our community. And I, I'm all about Habitat and what they do. And I would think that this would be a great uh, development for the needs of the people in Western Asia. Yeah. Is there a motion? I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve. Is Can there we any? clarify what? Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. Which one yes, so, so um, I'd like to ask for a motion for annexation and the rezoning of this in one atomic vote. We're going to try to do this with one vote. And, and associated land use. And the associated land, land use map amendments. Map amendments. So, so moved. So seconded. Okay. All right. Now we have that clear. Thanks. Well, I, I will say, I, you know, I, I agree with everything you said, uh, Councilman Wilkie, in terms of teachers and habitat and that sort of stuff. The big problem I still have with this is there may be 30% non-residential in one little area and we're looking for jobs. Section 3 is a fairy tale. That is a fairy tale. And that bothers me to bits, frankly. Um, I mean, I like the concept to, if, if it was a real concept but I just don't see it as a real concept, the way it's being presented to us. So. Well, I guess I'm already seeing jobs out there with Friendship High School. I'm seeing jobs out there that are going to be created with Friendship Elementary and Friendship Mill. And so those people are going to, you know, I'll, I'll just say it, the moms dropping their kids off at school, they're going to stop me a coffee somewhere. I mean, look at Salem, 
And I, and I think that's nice to have retail for services and things like that. And they'll stop off and get their coffee from <coughs> one of the people that come into Apex probably to work. It's not, still not, we're still not getting the type of jobs that uh, could be actually uh, allow people to live here. And, and it's in the opportunity that might happen in 20 years when Section 3 sells or whenever it does is fine. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to see that. But, you know, why not set aside for offices more of something that is actually under contract in this? It, I, I, I just, um, I, I see all the houses coming in and I really think that it's, it's really good that we can have some higher density, lower income housing. I think that's critical for that area. It's really critical for some of Apex, um, other parts of Apex, but, but, but we're, we're given the numbers that, uh, maximums but no minimum. That scares me. That says that it's wide open one direction, other than 30% of the residents have to, residential units have to be over, over um, office. And you know, it, it depends on how you do your residential units. That, that can go three stories in that area. You can uh, stack a bunch of residents over just a small square footage of retail and then have townhomes or something else elsewhere. So Is there a maximum still not of our units, in. residential units in this book? There is. At least I don't know what the moving target is now. It was like 860 total before, but I, I think it's come down. Like, do we have a new maximum residential units? Yes. It, the maximum right now is 835. 835. And that's for the overall development? Our minimum? One. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, sorry. All right, we have a motion and a second on the table. Yeah, I just also make a couple comments. I had concerns last time, primarily with the density of the new developer. And, um, my concern my last time was particularly with uh, Section 7, um, and I understand why they're going, they're leaving the way it is as it was last time, but they agreed to. Uh, lower the density in section six on the left side. Um, so overall, the, the density is going down, so which I like. Uh, I do share your concerns, Bill, but I guess my feeling is section three is gonna go pretty fast once this thing starts going. So um, even if it didn't, it's not enough to make me turn it down, so. I understand. I mean, I, I like much of it, I just. Yeah, I didn't know about to have that for the Pardon? I didn't know about the habitat for humanity. Yeah. And I, I think it's wonderful. No, habitat for humanity does a lot of good things. And I, if I felt good about real office space and if there was an actual minimum there, I'd vote for this in a heartbeat. Yeah. But I just think, I, I feel like I'm a horse being led to a mirage. There isn't no water there. So, well, let's call a vote because I know it's going to go three to one. Let's get it done. Okay. Anyone object to calling for the vote? All right. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say no. No. All right. That passes uh, three one. And to be clear, that was the annexation and the rezoning. And the land use map. And the land use, the land use map amendment. All right, that takes us now to new business number one. This is the possible motion to approve the West Village Master Subdivision Plan. Uh, Mike Clark is presenting, and if you want to take a couple of seconds to let sure. the crowd head towards the door, that'd be fine. Not really. Not really. We'll have, we'll have 100 acres. 
and we've got other areas out here. So, this, this is this is a mirage. This is a mirage. What it, oh, absolutely. Okay. All right, you got the floor. Right. This is a master subdivision request for the West Village development to orient you to the site. Um, the total development, um, as approved for the plan unit development, was uh, or is 100. 63.34 acres. Um, it does go on both sides of Kelly Road, uh, NC 540, also known as the toll roads right there, and Old US 1 is located here. Uh, Future Pleasant Plains Park is located there. The app or the property is currently zoned Plan Unit Development Conditional Zoning. It was approved as part of uh, application 15 CZ 33. And the uh, 2030 land use map does include a uh, portion of the property um, being medium density to residential, while the remainder of the property um, would be mixed use, uh, office employment, high density residential, and commercial services. The applicant did hold a neighborhood meeting on this project on November 17, 2016. A copy of that report was included in your application packet. And the applicant is proposing to construct a total of um, 86 single family residential units and 294 townhome units. Currently, the site is a combination of single family homes, uh, open areas, forest land, as well as several streams that meander through the property. Uh, the applicant has broken this into um, the residential component of this into three sections. There's a townhome section up near Old US 1. Uh, this map is rotated, north is this way. Um, uh, townhome section located here adjacent to NC 540 and Kelly Road and then a single-family residential section located here uh, which would be get my orientation correctly west of Kelly Road in total the applicant is providing uh, is required to provide 27 percent RCA um, being that the site will be mass graded uh, within the residential component, um, the applicant would end up having 41.48% of RCA. The applicant is also meeting the requirements of seven or section 7.3.1 of the UDO in terms of private play lawns, which would be located here, here, here. There's a portion here, and then the one in many center there, and then in many center here. Uh, the smallest of the play lawns is 0.43 acres, the largest is 0.61. Um, there would be extensive uh, public utility connections um, through off-site improvements, including sewer easements that would come off of the property here, and then water would have to be extended down Kelly Road and over to US-1. Um, in terms of design guidelines, the uh, minimum lot size for the single-family residential component located here is 7,000 uh, with or is, yeah, minimum is 7,000 with an average of 8,000 and as you heard previously a minimum of 10,000 square feet for lots within 100 feet of the neighboring development um, as shown the applicant does meet that townhomes uh, the minimum width is 22 feet um, and in both situations the applicant was able to meet it the applicant has also uh, agreed to all the residential conditions that were part of the um, plan unit development request. This is uh, a bit closer of a detail of the northern section, which has single family residential on the west side of Kelly Road, and then townhomes between NC 540 and Kelly Road, with uh, full movement access here. It would connect in. This is future commercial in this location, as well as over in this location. And then the south section, which would have a drive that would line up with Pleasant Plains Road, continue up and then have a secondary access uh, to US-1 through the future commercial section. Wasn't there a roundabout there at one point? There is, it, in order to fit it on the screen, we're unable oh, okay. to show it. Okay. Um, eventually, there will be a second roundabout, which would connect up to Kelly Road as well, okay. through the commercial phase. I'll go through these. 
uh, save time. In terms of landscaping and buffers, along Kelly Road, there would be a 30-foot type A. Along NC 540, a 100-foot type A. And adjacent to West Winds, it is a 40-foot buffer. Uh, 30 of it would be an undisturbed buffer, as well as a 10-foot type A. And then along Old US 1, it would be um, a 30-foot type E. And then adjacent to other residential, um, it would be a 10-foot type A. Along, along high, Old Highway 1, it's 30-foot type E? Correct. Even where there's houses? That is correct. So the back of those townhouses right there is that 30-foot E? On the sides of them, yes, that's correct. On the sides of this it. Was, this was put together before we changed the UDO. That is correct. So it's grandfathered in. Yeah, the fronts of the townhouses would face the cul-de-sac in this location. You didn't talk to the developer about possibly upgrading that, did you? I mean, it's voluntary for them at this point. I inquired about it uh, as part of the rezoning, but I do not re remember what their response was. I believe it was something with the commercial component as well. <clears throat> well, the commercial component does need the visibility, but the townhomes sure don't. Um, the applicant has also provided uh, architectural examples of what the townhomes as well as single-family residential structures would look like. And the planning board held um, a meeting on July 10th and unanimously recommended approval. Um, staff can also recommend approval contingent upon uh, the applicant being able to still meet section 8.1.6 subsection B of the UDO. There's still some trees that would need to be protected within the required buffers. Um, the applicant has indicated that they will be able to accomplish that. Does anybody have any questions? Um, there's there's the full uh, access intersection across from uh, Pleasant uh, Park. That is correct. And the other is limited access right in, right out. That is correct. Could that ever be changed to Full access, I guess. I'm going to defer that to myself. I figured that might. I, I saw him jumping up and down. <laughs> um, now's okay if Mike's okay with that. I'm good with that. <laughs> All right. For the residential phase, it'll be right in, right out in the interim. Uh, the only reason they're required to do that uh, at this time is because when they go over 50 units, they have to have a second point of access. The um, ultimate plan in the zoning for the commercial phase is to convert that to full movement. And then where Kelly Road is now, that would go to right and right out because of the close proximity to, to 540. Um, that is subject to DOT uh, review and approval. So, you know, that could change. If DOT says they want to keep Kelly Road open as full movement, um, that's fine. We'll go with that in the future. It may require some additional improvements at that time, but we'll, we'll have those discussions um, when we approach them about converting it. While you're there, I have one more question, if I may, and that is, uh, it was mentioned about line of sight on Kelly Road for um, entrance to the development and uh, buses. It, 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 would that be changed to uh, grade down that hill, or uh, is that in the cards at all? Uh, we'll, look, we'll certainly look at that location. I mean, that's something good to point out. Um, we have had issues with developments in the past where they've had to make adjustments or they've had to change the grade in the road um, in more extreme cases to uh, satisfy site distance concerns. That's one of the things DOT asks for um, when there are problems with site distance. So. Yeah, and that's a DOT road, so they would have to be the ones. Is that it correct? is, and we'll look yeah. at it as part of the plan right. process. I mean, typically that's not something you see until construction plan, but now if the applicants heard that concern, mm -hmm. um, hopefully they'll go ahead and look at that now with us at site plan. Um, and, you know, it's certainly good to know about that sooner rather than later in case some adjustments can be made at this time. And you're satisfied with what there is? It's a three-lane road, I think, uh, on those, on the entranceway, like, uh, all of Chapel, is that correct? Um, I, I, I don't know which one, that one there, is that three lane? We have a zoom in of that road they're showing to show exactly what it looks like. Oh, yeah, here, go back. If we can zoom in a little bit better to show that. 
No, keep going back. There we go. So not have so many grading lines. Mm -hmm. um, it's yeah. As it comes in off Pleasant Plains, it's actually. Um, I mean, you've got you've got a median entrance island. You've got mm -hmm. two lanes exiting, one lane coming in. It goes down to a two lane collector type roadway with um, part with parallel parking on street. So that helps to separate that parking from the travelway um, in order to make that road a you know a higher level facility, um, to be able to carry more volume, and you don't have driveways fronting it. So it operates like a collector street with additional parking. I don't think we classified Shannon as a minor thoroughfare in this case. I think we, if, if it's just a special collector street cross section is the way we've labeled it. I never noticed this before, but it seems like kind of odd to but to me it's a lot of cars going through there. And um, you know, it's all this with Kelly and to have parallel parking on there seems a little disruptive to me. There is some balance there. I mean, one of the things that parallel parking helps to do is, of course, satisfy you know parking um, concerns that we get in more urban style developments. You know, gives a lot of extra guest parking. It also helps to um, calm traffic somewhat without actually interfering with the travel way. So people are driving through there, they see the on-street parking, um, but they're not impeded by it in terms of it encroaching on the travel way and causing a problem for two cars to pass each other. So the higher volumes can move through, but they also have the effect, the visual effect of the on-street parking. Well, these, these, and these will be formal marked yep. parallel parking. They will. And obviously the site triangle will be well preserved. I'm thinking in, uh, in line with what Ms. Killingsworth was mentioning earlier about the Amber Gate Station and Windy Road, um, just as a parallel kind of concept, how do we see this scenario playing outward? This is a road with parallel parking and obviously residential on both sides. Will there be pedestrians wanting to cross and finding it tricky or will that be taken into account as well? Well, the, right there at the intersections, it does, of course, neck down. Your parallel spaces have some offset. Um, there, there are two ways we can look at sight distance. One of those is our standard sight triangles, which are measured off the right of way. But those don't do a great job in terms of projecting sight distance across parking spaces because if you project that sight distance, you're going to be behind parked cars. Um, the other way they can look at it is with the um, standard roadway design sight triangles projected from a driver's line of sight. Um, where you measure that is 15 feet back from the travel way and it's projected out and the distance is based on the, the um, anticipated speed of the roadway. Um, so we can certainly check those lines of sight and see if parking interferes. Uh, one thing we can do is we can cut down um, on some of the parking spaces that are close to the intersections. Um, we did some of that out here on Hunter Street when these par we spaces were put in. Um, we cut back some spaces to give a little more sight distance. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll consider that as part of the review. Yeah, I, I know. I want to make sure we're doing what we can do to prevent um, forcing people to park their car on the stop stripe so that they can see safely. And right now, I know there are a few places where the stop stripe, if you actually stop behind it, you can't adequately see. And it may be because of a parked car or maybe because of landscaping or other things but you know the obviously the 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 stop stripe has a reason for how far it is back yeah, the stop stripes are typically set based on an offset from a crosswalk in some cases they may be without a crosswalk they don't necessarily um, dictate where you're supposed to stop to be able to see stop traffic the proper way to proceed through an intersection is to come to a complete stop behind the stop bar and then if you can't see roll forward slowly until you can see um, that's where Ashto sight distance comes into effect, where it's 15 feet offset from the travel way. In a lot of cases, you'll have stop bars set back much further than that offset. Um, and we do get complaints sometimes from drivers that they stop at the stop bar and they can't see. Um, but there's a lot of locations like that. And quite frankly, when you try to clear sight distance too much, um, you know, to account for driver stop too far back from the intersection and still able to see, we get more stop sign running because drivers have a longer perspective. As you're approaching sure. the intersection, they can see way far afield and they just kind of roll through without coming to a full stop. So there's a balance there sure. between the two. Uh, yeah. We, and we heard, okay, sorry. You, no. We, we just heard earlier about villages of Apex having a line of sight problems with cars parking close. So those aren't designated spots, though, are they? Right, they're, they're not just, designated they're spots. They're just they're, they're simply just parking up. Mm -hmm. close. And we've we've been out there, and I think the police have issued some citations in those cases. For the most part, we haven't noticed 
significant problems out there, at least in our opinion, in terms of sight distance. But if you get out there in some cases with a measuring tape and you measure exactly per our ordinances, you might see a violation. Um, but, but again, in most cases, we haven't seen um, quite the problems that we've heard. Um, part of that, again, is the difference between an expectation for a more suburban style cul-de-sac, closed off neighborhood versus a more urban type development. Um, when you get more urban type um, developments, like in downtown areas, for instance, you don't always have the same line of sight. Um, you're going to have parking, you're going to have a lot more pedestrians, you're going to have more things to deal with, and that's, that's something we deal with too, is expectations in different types of developments when people move in. Any other questions for Russell or Mike? Or Shannon? Mike, did you ever get a response on that 30-foot type E buffer? You said you weren't really sure on, that, on the long old US one there that... I did not, but the applicant is President, if you'd like to ask him directly. By the townhomes? Yes. Yeah. What was the question? The 30-foot Type E buffer. Um, Change it. Today. Oh, you mean uh, see if there will be a, a voluntary, voluntary change? Yeah. This makes the neighborhood better. Is the applicant here to speak on that? Where's Where's the applicant? This is this is requesting additional landscaping, basically, on the side of those townhouses. Correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. To get more. Hi, could you state your name for us? I'm Josh Decker with McAdams Company. Okay. The question's related to a change in buffer type. Yeah, the 30 foot type B along the townhouses on Old US One right there by Pleasant Plains. Yes. Um, they're fine with that change. Okay. So, what, to a be specific. What, what's to the type A? Type a? Yes, it's so a 30 foot type A. I don't know the specific no, off of my head, yeah. but it would be an increase in planting. Yeah, that's new to our UDO, and we're having everybody do it basically. Mike, is that you got that? Okay, all right. Can I just make sure you're just talking about the oh gosh, which I can't tell what direction. The, I guess yeah, the west, no. the west this side is, of Pleasant this, Plain. This, yeah, this, the southern side, the southern edge. The Right. Yeah, townhomes only. Mm -hmm. That's right. The residential portion. Right. Not across the non residential piece. That's right. right. No, we want a ten foot wall there. Okay. Um thank you for yeah, thank you for representing the applicant there. Yeah. So I heard that as a condition. I saw some people writing that down, so we're good. Okay. Any any other <laughs> anything else? I guess I'd just like to make a couple of comments. Okay, you yeah, got the floor. That's okay. Um, Mr. Swamp, thanks for all your effort in putting that together. Um, you know, I encourage you. I think staff has already taken note of some of the things you talked about. I keep working with them and, and the developer. And, um, you know, I, I think we are willing to look at all those traffic concerns and issues. Um, you know, one thing uh, through this process, too, the, the, uh, they're providing you guys, I think, $75,000 in a trust fund to help with the water for your neighborhood. That's unheard of. First time I've ever heard of that. And I verified that with the uh, senior ranking council member here. Uh -huh. You're very kind. I did talk to some neighbors too out there that are on well and septic and this is gonna bring water to them. They're very thrilled about it. They live just kind of just down Kelly Road a little way. So they're, they're super excited about the, the uh, not having to drink out of bottled water and take showers out of bottled of water anymore. So um, it's going to do a lot of good out there for that area. I'm excited about the non-residential piece. Um, I think uh, Mr. Sears is, um, from sitting with him for a couple hours, he's he's ready to go. He's just waiting for the right opportunity. He's going ahead and taking that step and rezoning the land and making it easy for an end user. So if you sat with me, I'd be ready to go too. <laughs> <laughs> Give him a hug later. <laughs> um, I appreciate that. Any, any, anything else you want to make, or do you um, want to just the, carry that into a motion? It sounds like. Uh, I do, do you want to? Well, uh, do you want to follow? I, I want to make a comment. I, I was waiting until the motion was made, though. Go ahead. I'll okay. make a motion to approve this. All right. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second. All right. We have a motion and a second to approve with the condition. Mm -hmm. With the condition. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Do you want? The, the only comments I made. I've been opposed. From this project from the beginning, but I just think the traffic does not work well, uh, especially with Kelly Road and with the Pleasant Park opening up. I think it's just going to be one big headache down there. So 
Uh, I'm going to vote no, but I've uh, got the traffic issues. Well, I, you know, I understand, and I've, I've looked at this on the traffic situation. It, it, I think there could be problems, but I'm going to rely on our staff on that aspect. And it, the way it comes through and the way, way it eventually comes through, it will get dispersed to a degree throughout this uh, development um, with the two roads going on to Highway 1. So um, I have mixed emotions on all of these things, but I, I, I think there's an opportunity for a reasonable amount of uh, non-residential there. Uh, if I was sitting here on a situation where it was a rezoning like we had before, I'd start, I would have pushed back a lot harder with respect to Mr. Sears and tried to get um, some sort of a timeline once again. We don't have a timeline with Mr. Sears, but um, I understand Wes has broken his arm now and, and uh, he, may, he may move. Um, kind of sad in a way to see that happen. It, it, it's old apex kind of disappearing a little bit each time. What I know I came here for was the ambiance of, of uh, the olives, the olive <laughs> road, uh, and, and all of that. But it's gradually becoming urban. Uh, but I came here because there was a house that I could buy, and I recognized that. You wanted out of California, didn't you? Well, I wanted out of Los Angeles, yeah. the armpit of California. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's well. That was a place that, as a child, quite frankly, it was a very nice place to live. We lived on a half an acre, which became a huge number of apartments, and uh, and that's really the reason why I ended up trying to run for council is because I saw what a disaster that had become. It was. I was delighted as we flew over L.A. leaving, saying goodbye. But it was a wonderful place to grow up in, I will say that. But just they poured way too many people into it, just way, way too many. All right, we have a, a motion and a second to approve with the condition uh, of the type A buffer along the townhouses on the south side of the property um, and um, along South Salem Street. And, and I'll say I'll okay. kind of what uh, echo what Mr. Moyer said. Feel like strong, feel strongly that our staff has listened to them, and hopefully we'll do the things. And as this progresses, we'll do the right things all throughout it. Um, I, I had to lift the buffer. I'm also pleased that people are going to get water out there. We said that before, but I do hope that as this continues to expand, that we will do. Staff will pay attention to this and make the road improvements as necessary, and um, make it a, a great place, and that the neighbors. All right, any objection if I call for the vote? Okay, all in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed say no. No. All right, that passes 3-1. Thank you, Mr. Moyer, for the uh, buffer award. And we now move to new business number two. So this is a possible motion to adopt an ordinance to allow the sale of alcoholic beverages beginning at 10 a.m. in accordance with session law 2017-87 from the state of North Carolina. Uh, presenting is uh, Town Manager Drew Havens. I'll pause for a second while some folks leave. All right, Mr. Havens, you have the floor. Mr. Mayor, you introduced it very well. And before you are two versions of the ordinance amendment. One, version A, would allow the sale of alcohol and beverages to any licensed establishment uh, beginning at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. Uh, version B, the difference is it restricts it just to locations that serve the food. Uh, the session law or the Senate bill uh, did relax North Carolina standards to come in line with 47 other states. 
uh, allowed him to sell alcohol uh, in the in the morning. Uh, prior to that, uh, the North Carolina law said uh, noon time. We got those two versions in front. All right, thank you. Um, and just before we begin the discussion, um, we we talked a little bit about how to present this, and I thought the best thing to do would be give council a couple of options. As many know, this was presented as a brunch bill, so one of the options I thought made sense was to say, if you're out for brunch and you're buying food and you want to buy something to go with it, if it's after 10 a.m., that's you know sticking with the spirit of the name brunch bill. The other, which is what uh, other municipalities have done, is just open it up to all sales of alcohol at 10 a.m. Uh, that would include tap rooms, bars, grocery stores. So you have the two options in front of you. Um, open up for conversation with the council members at this time. First, I'm in favor of option A uh, to let anybody, not just restaurants, sell. Uh, starting at 10 o'clock on Sundays mornings, it lines well with the uh, state law and it kind of doesn't play favors. So. Okay. I'm fine with option A as well. I think that, I mean, I, I can't see places opening up that early, honestly. I mean, I, I think it'll be bad business maybe if they decide to open up that early. Everybody's in church usually till 12-ish or something, but I'm fine with I'm fine option with A and live for, every, for everybody, every, every establishment. Yes. Um, I, I was telling you, I was lobbied by the think tank of Apex, the um, 80-year-olds and above from Baptist Church, they were a little concerned about this, but uh, then one of the group said that if they don't get it here, they'll get it somewhere else. And so in the name of economic impact <laughs> and business in APEX, I'll go along with option A. Well, it sounds like we have a consensus. Is there a motion? I'll make I'll a motion. I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve option A. Any further discussion? No, I, I, I well, one question I have is, can, I thought it was for service as a drink. I, I Would you like to clarify? This clar allows for the sale of alcohol beverages from any licensed establishment at 10 a.m. Period. Right. And it doesn't matter whether it's beer, liquor, wine. Poor, poor or comes in whatever, a bottle. Whatever their license allows them to do, they okay. can just have, rather than being able to start at noon, they'd be able to start at 10 a.m. Yeah. And I, personally, I, I think. Um, I, th I think it's fine. It's good that they moved it back to 10 o'clock. Um, and it's basically a religious, religious law because we're talking about churches. But we have a mixed community. We have <coughs> Jewish people here who go to the synagogue on Saturday, I believe, and Muslims who go to um, their place of worship on Friday. So it is a specialized law that we're dealing with, and relaxing it, I think, is the right thing to do. Are we a call for a vote? It, uh, yeah, if nobody else has any discussion. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. All right, the motion passes for option A approval. We now have completed all of the agenda items, save the one closed session item. Uh, this is a possible motion to go into closed session to discuss matters for location or expansion of industries or businesses in the town of Apex. I'll make a motion. Go in closed um, session. Excuse me. Can I clarify that we actually have an additional? Is there additional cause reason? Yes, to consult with the town attorney. And to consult with town attorney. All right. You accept the motion. friendly amendment there on that motion. Is I there a second? The no. All right. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All right. Before I call for the vote, I'll just remind the, the public that there is no further items on our agenda. We will be in closed session when we come back out. We will reconvene for the purpose of adjourning. But we will be back out here in case you want to wait. Uh, with all that said, uh, I'll call for the vote. All in favor of going to closed session, indicate by saying aye. aye. All opposed, no. All right, we're now going into closed session. <laughs>